Hey friends, good to see you guys tonight on our Wednesday night Bible study. We are in chapter 9 of our book, Timothy Keller, uh, on prayer, experiencing awe and intimacy with God. We're actually going to break this uh, entire book down into four chapters or four portions uh, of this chapter. And so uh, let's begin tonight by praying. Father, we stop for just a second as we begin to study your word to ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would mold us and make us, Lord, that when our conversation with you is not just simply some magical formula or something, dear Father, that we think is uh, that if we just do certain things, then you'll hear us. But God, would you help us to uh, honor you, uh, to be able to focus and take a moment to think theologically as we address you so that, Lord, as we grow in you, that we get stronger and stronger day in and day out. So, Lord, we believe you for this. I ask that you would speak to our hearts now, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said together, amen and amen. So we're talking about prayer, and uh, tonight we want to talk about what uh, prayer uh, requires. And so when we talk about what prayer requires, if you have your books, I want you to follow along with me in 125, is that the first thing prayer requires is that it's grace. It's uh Prayer must be, in Jesus' name, based on the gospel. You and I have a very high, uh, a high cost of admission to the presence of God, and that is by the name of Jesus. And that high cost was paid on the cross 2,000 years ago. Um, Timothy says in the first paragraph, he says, Our prayer must be in full a great awareness that our access to God is a free gift won by the costly sacrifice of Christ. Now, Here's the thing that he wants you to understand, though. It's enacted by the Holy Spirit, and it helps us uh, to know that inwardly we are his children. Now, to pray in Jesus' name, though, is not a magical formula. It's not. But it is something specific that Jesus asked us to do. In shorthand, Jesus' name uh, is his divine person and saving work. Therefore, that covenant that is made when Jesus dies on the, lives sinlessly, dies upon the cross, and is raised sacrificially is everything we need to be right with God. I love what he says. He says, to come to the Father in Jesus' name, not our own, is to come fully cognizant that we are being heard because of the costly grace now which we stand. It's the guarantee because of the price that he paid for you and for me. I love the fact that we come to God in Jesus' name. Remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about that prayer is not stressing toward God, right? It's uh, it's not so much like going to a counselor and going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And we're all freaking out over it. No, when we pray and we specifically pray in the name of Jesus, we're coming to the God who has unlimited resources, who can handle what we need. And so prayer requires that we come to him with, with grace, that we know that we're covered, that your entrance into his presence has been paid for and bought, not by your works, but by what Christ has done for you, and that we have that power, as John 14 says, Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Come on, talk about, talk about that kind of coupon, man, talk about that kind of gift card, it's powerful. And so when we pray, uh, a prayer addresses direct. when we pray in his name, it addresses Jesus directly. I love what J.I. Packer, as he responds to it, says this in the, in the paragraph on 126. I pray to the Father through the mediation of the Son and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. I may speak also to the Son and the Spirit directly when this is appropriate. That is, when I am praying about something that the Scripture specified as the direct concern of either. And so there are times that I'm like, Jesus, be glorified in your life as Jesus prays in John 17. Lord, be, let, them, be, let me be glorified now as, uh, as of the glory that I had before I was with you in uh um, in, in the book of Ephesians, when Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, at that moment, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, fill me, stir up the gift of God that is within me. But the form and function of most all of my prayers is in the name of Jesus, because why? You are able to pray in the grace given you through Christ. The next thing that prayer uh, demands is that it demands fear. And, and that is a, a fear, is that, in other words, is that prayer is the heart 
engaged in loving all. It's loving all. When there really is a respect and a, a trembling, gracious uh, heart disposition before the Lord is a powerful thing. Uh, Timothy Keller says, we know that the heart should be engaged in prayer. Now, here's where I see people cross denominational lines and how individuals pray, how they understand their praying, is that our prayers, Jesus even said it in the New Testament, think, that, think not that you're heard by your many words. This isn't just the magic formula. I want my heart to be engaged in prayer. Why? The heart is the seat of my will. David said, Lord, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. So it's very pivotal and personal that when my heart is engaged, I'm not just trying to present my list before a celestial Santa Claus. No, I'm entering into communication with God. And it is a very dear thing that I take what I say to God very seriously in that it's not a casual conversation. I'm going to the one that can make the difference. Um, Matthew 18, these pe Jesus said, these people are uh, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You know, it really does raise a question then is that when I come to the Lord in prayer, what do I do with my heart? I think that's why it's always important that, that confession is a portion of our prayer, that when we come before the Lord, our heart, the scripture tells us is deceitfully wicked, man, our heart can talk us into some things that nothing else can all based off of circumstances, emotions, or the cultural trends that are around us. Therefore, I want to put my heart at the feet of Jesus and ask him to renew it. In the Westminster Larger Catechism, it says that prayer should engage the affections and with the due apprehensions of what? God's power, his majesty, and his grace. Think about that is that prayer engages the affections and with the due apprehensions of God is powerful, God is majestic and God is gracious. Think about what he's doing there. He's, uh, he's taking us to some uh, pretty amazing theological con concepts. Um, God is powerful. As a matter of fact, he can what? Do whatever he mighty well pleases when he wants to do it. When I come to God knowing that he's powerful enough to squash me, or lift me up. He's powerful enough to 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 uh, to put something on me or to take it away. It should engage my heart differently when I know that God is majestic. It was majestic that uh, 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 old, the old song, "Oh Lord, Oh Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth." That His name is powerful and there's a majesty to it. There's a royalty. There's an unknown about it. There's a um, uh, there is a specialness. The, the, earlier today, I heard about a uh, LeBron James, a famous basketball player, and he loves his fans, loves kids specifically, and is always willing to take a picture with the kids. And there was one young lady, she was about 11 years old, she got to meet him, and she was so in awe of being able to stand next to him and him actually talk to her that when he asked her what her name was, <laughs> she couldn't say it. Do you have that kind of affection for Jesus? When in your prayer, do you have such a majesty for the power and the grace and the glory of God that it draws you just, oh man, amazingly into that you're almost undone. Like you can't, you can't even think straight sometimes because of the majesty that you uh, put toward Christ. And then to know the affections of his grace. And this is why we pray in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he gave the choice treasure of heaven, Jesus Christ, for brokenness like us. It was grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. He gave it to us, and therefore we should celebrate. So in the next paragraph on 126, no one today thinks of drawing near to God as being traumatic or lethal. Think about that. You know, the one thing that I would caution young pastors about is that, um, uh, is that God does forgive sins, but he also judges sin. Uh, sometimes I think to be relevant and to uh, to seem uh, current with our culture is that the message of the gospel is that God loves sinners and, and that God is a friend of sinners and that and that God is willing to accept you just as you are. And that is so biblical and it's so true. But here's the other portion of that. God judges sinners. And so once he's knocked on your door, once he starts calling you, once he begins to say, hey, this is what I want out of your life, then there's an accountability there. Many of us never think about it being dangerous to stand in the presence of God. Moses sure did. 
Maybe you remember the story in Exodus of Moses going up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments that God would not allow him to see him face to face. Now, later in the tent, the meeting, they would meet together as a friend meets with a friend is what the scripture says. But when Moses was on that mountain, he was to have turned, uh, turned around. Otherwise, the presence of God would have killed him because of the holiness. And what I love what, what he does here is he says, God allowed Moses only to see his back or, the, or outskirts and said he would cover Moses with his hand so that he would be protected from God's holiness and wouldn't die. Think about that. Moses is protected from God by God. Is that not the gospel? How amazing is that? Moses is protected from God by God. So what does that mean? That shows you the theological concept that God's love to take you just as you are but won't leave you the same way found you is also the, the same coin but a different side to God's wrath which is his love spurned, that that only God could love you and discipline you in, an, in true justice as you should be handled as a child of God. Why? Because he's a good, good father. He's a holy father. There's no one else like him because he's powerful, majestic, and gracious. So in, in him allowing us to experience his great power, his great majesty, and his grace, he also covers us. How amazing is that? You know, years ago, uh, when I went to a trade school in high school, trying to figure out what I wanted to do before I felt the call of God in my life to go to ministry, I tried a les- residential electricity. I absolutely loved that. I also tried welding. And I was always enamored with the fact that you had to have a shield on you to look at the majesty of the, the electric co- connection that was taking place in welding, specifically TIG, TIG welding, MIG welding, uh, or, or some type of stick welding. There was a covering so you could actually participate in something amazing and dangerous all at the same time. That is who Jesus is for us. He is the covering so that we can participate in the melding of two two natures to one uh, by a very, very significant power that outside of the bonds of what you have in welding could actually ruin you and hurt you. And the same thing can happen when God's holiness and his righteousness meets with his glory in our life in a very saving act. Wow, what a savior we have. He goes on to talk about that that this loving all, this fear is a loving all. He says on 127, loving all conveys that we should approach God with neither uh, with neither a sentimental or casual familiarity nor a stilted remote familiarity. What does that mean? A stilted, um, a, a sentimentality or a casual familiarity. Sometimes I see this with, um, uh, with couples. They can get so familiar with one another that they, they forget that they're joking or uh, maybe some pet names or things that they do that they don't actually hurt. They don't hurt the other person's feelings. And sometimes as a pastor, when I sit down with people and I say, what seems to be the issue? And one of them will say, I just never get any respect. And the other spouse looks at the person and they say, what are you talking about? And they say, well, you make these snide comments. You know what that is? It's a sentimentality or it is a, um, a casual familiarity of stilted remote f- uh, formality to where there's no real affection. The affection that you have is really taken for granted. There's also the times of sentimentality to where uh, we do this a lot in church where wherever there's a stained glass or wherever there's a a plaque or wherever there is a, something that was nominated and donated and we put we put uh, you know it's like sacred furniture in the church uh, uh, sometimes we get so sentimental about it that there's no thought of that ever changing and so uh, sometimes we do that with God. God wants to grow us and move us, but maybe you, uh, because of either the pastor that you've had or the school of thought that you've had, it's instead of an engaging, growing walk with Jesus, it's just a sentimental walk to where you can remember when you were eight years old and you walked down the aisle of the church and you prayed to receive Christ, but you've never done anything in your walk. Now, you can go back to that day, praise God, but it's all sentimentality. 
It's all the sentiment. And that's uh, you can always know that when you get angry that those early sentiments that were downloaded in your heart and your mind with your exposure to God, if those are not attended to all the time, because that's the only way you know how to ex uh, experience God, which can be very, very, very dangerous. Think about COVID-19 when you can't go to church. Man, this Easter, first time I hadn't been in church in decades. I'm talking decades, y'all. And and it was there was something missing. Had my relationship with Christ only been sentimental, then my entire year would have been swept out of form. Why? Because maybe that's the only time you go to church. Maybe that's the only time you think about the goodness and the power of God is just on Easter morning. Christ calls you not to a stilted formality. He calls you to, and not even to a sentimentality, he calls you to a real living and abiding faith. Let's talk about stilted formality. Um, maybe you're a part of a civic group and you participate in Robert, Robert's Rules of Orders. And so call for question, uh, you, you, point of, uh, you point of action, those kind of things. Is that all you know about God? That it is a stilted formality. We get up, we sit down. We kneel, we stand up. We take the cup, we pass this. We pass the offering plate. Is that all you know about God? Or is that power of the formalism of really knowing who God is, does it draw a fear and a, and a respect to where you say it is amazing to stand in the presence of such a powerful, majestic, and gracious God? I love it in the last paragraph as well as he says, the taking oneself in hand can proceed by what? And, and I made some notes here. Thinking briefly about a theological aspect uh, that should be of God when you pray. Uh, you know, uh, think about the times that you pray. Maybe it's in the morning, you get up, you go take a shower, and you're like, Lord, bless my day. Help me as you're shaving, you're getting ready. And you're like, Lord, help my day and help me and keep me safe and watch over my family. All of those are important prayers, powerful prayers. But have you ever stopped to grab the theological concept that God is all, in, all is totally in control and let that guide your prayer and be maybe more specific or all inspiring? Um, maybe uh, before you sit down for lunch to eat. It's not just, Lord, bless this food and nourishment our body and me to your service, but it is, Lord, thank you that today I think about God uh, and, and the theological concept in, in, uh, in, in Philippians that says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, that your lunch then turns into a worship moment to where you say, God, I just want to say thank you that you honor yourself in my life right now by giving me my daily bread by supplying even through this big mac or this peanut butter and jelly sandwich or leftovers from last night that you care about the most simple things in my life and i just want to exalt you for that think about have you ever thought about on your way into your house you know most of us are tired by the time we get off work and sometimes we're most ill when we walk into the house too and everybody's clamoring for our attention. Have you ever thought that pulling into the driveway on the, or on, totally on the way home, that you would just stop and take oneself in your hand and grab onto a theological concept of God, that he has intended you to have a place of rest, and he has intended you to have shelter. And as you pull in, and as he, he's intended you to live in a relationship. That's our Sunday morning services uh, series, Better Together. And as you pull in to say, Lord, let no selfishness, because you call me to surrender my will to you. Let no selfishness stand in the way of me being able to honor you by how I treat my family for the next, I don't know, four, five, six, seven, eight hours that you're with them before it's time to go to bed. Just stopping briefly, grabbing a theological concept that you know about God and praying very awe-inspired and a fearful uh, prayer where you are engaging in him with your heart toward God about where you are. And then finally, I want us to look at this real quick, is that prayer requires a helplessness. Prayer um, is, that should be is, accepting weakness and dependence. When you pray, are you exposing your helplessness? Prayer by, def uh, by defining prayer, this is on 127, the bottom, as an attitude of mind and heart characterized prim primarily a helplessness. As far as I can see, one writer says, prayer has been ordained only for the helpless. Prayer and helplessness is inseparable. 
Only he who is helpless can truly pray. Now, what we're not saying here is that prayer and devotion to Christ is only, as a Marxist would say, Karl Marx would say, uh, for those who could not do any better or those who are not strong enough to survive. No, ma'am, no, sir. That is not what prayer is. Prayer is a relinquishing to say that I, I account myself a desolate in this world as compared to the power and the majesty and the grace that God has to supply in my life. He says, uh, middle of 128, prayer, however, is made for those who have no other recourse, no other resort. Sometimes that is what draws us to pray, isn't it? Think about the times that you've gone through a season, man, of struggle. Woo, season of unknown, season of medical unrest, emotional unrest, and all your resources are absolutely bankrupt. Does anybody does anybody have to beg you to pray then? <laughs> nope. You can't wait to prayer. Prayer is as necessary in your life as your next breath. <gasps> you're just gasping for it, begging God, and you're even asking your friends. You're calling them to pray. Pray for this. 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 Because God doesn't move what? We're not going to make it. What are you doing? You're confessing. I'm helpless. Why does it always take the bad times for us to be able to have a confidence in God and a dependence on God that says, look, I'm helpless. Jesus told us in John's gospel, apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. And that has to be a disposition within our life. The beauty of this is that in some way, prayer is simply connecting Jesus to our absolute helplessness your sense of fragility and dependence to where you're really willing to say, it's kind of like this. Have you ever had a broken appliance or you ever had an electrical issue at your house? You ever had something that HVAC that you just couldn't fix? You didn't have the tools, you didn't have anything. And it, you call a serviceman and, uh, or woman, and as soon as they come into your home, uh, you, they ask you what's going on, and then they, sh then you show them the problem. What are you doing? You are declaring in a very physical act of showing them where they need to work, saying, "I'm helpless, and unless you fix it, there's no way it's going to be fixed." That's what we should be doing in prayer. It's the invite of Christ into our spiritual home, into our life into the things he already knows about, and then addressing him out of the power and the majesty and the grace that is so fluid in him and so powerful in him, and taking him to the spot and saying, I'm plunging this at your feet. I'm desperate for you. As a matter of fact, apart from you, I'm helpless, and I need you to work. The Bible's so convinced of this attitude that in Romans 8, 26, it says that even in our weaknesses, when we don't know what to pray, God's already taken care of it, that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that words can't even articulate. When you look at the last paragraph in 128, he says, in fact, our helplessness can also be a source of confidence. You know, in my, in my phone, in my smartphone, I have... Um, go to people. How about you? Do you have that? When I have an issue, when I have a uh, problem, when I have something that I know needs to be fixed, I go to my go to people. And, and I, I do that very, very specifically because why? I have a great amount of confidence in those people. What they told me, I can rely on. They never gouge me. They charge me exactly. They're, they're making a little money, but they're not making it all on me. And I built a relationship with them. That's what prayer ought to be, is a confidence in helplessness to reach out to say, as what the psalmist said, heaven and earth uh, will pass away, but the Lord is the strength and portion, of, is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Whom have I in heaven but you, O Lord, the psalmist says. So it's a great confidence, but in that confidence is also saying a helplessness. So that it, that's what it is. It is a, it is a fear. It, it, well, let's just look at it. Let's review uh, what prayer is. It's work. Prayer is a duty and a discipline. It is the word. Prayer is a conversing with God. So it's work. We got to work at this. So keep praying. It's word. It's a conversation with God. It's a balance. It's a balance of adoration, of confession, of thanks, and supplication to where you humble yourself. And 
while it's all that, it requires some specific things. Think about it this way. It requires grace that it, we've got to be covered. That's the only access you have to God. That's your VIP pass is his, his riches at Christ's expense. And therefore, to access that grace, we pray in the name of Jesus. It takes a fear. Prayer is the heart engaged in loving all. Where I have an amazing amount of respect for God, my heart is engaged to Him, and I'm calling out to Him, saying, "Lord, I need You." It's a, it's a, an awe and a fear, and then finally, it's a an helplessness. And prayer is accepting one, one's weakness and their dependency. As I know who I am and I know how powerful He is, I stop for a second and I begin to process the theological aspect of who he is and how then I'm going to address him. And I do so for the balance of adoration, confession, um, uh, thanks, and supplication. It all works together. That's what makes study and prayer so difficult because at some point it's like a bowl of spaghetti. You, you learn strands, but when you really start praying, man, they all go together. And that's why prayer is so much work, but it's a work that has a good reward. And so I want to encourage you, where are you at? Are you covered in His grace? Do you have a fear, a loving all that you engage Him with? And do you express your helplessness to Him? Or when you pray, are you just lecturing God? Are you just lecturing Him about what you want, what He already knows? A lot of prayer is wasted like that. It's like a person's having a conversation with themselves as though they're reciting some kind of motto or some kind of mantra or something. That's not what we're doing. When we pray as believers, we are praying in our helplessness. The Holy Spirit's making intercession for us, and we're stepping forward in faith with a confidence as Jesus is the greatest service man ever to say, here's what's broken, you can fix it. Not only do you know how, you've got all the resources, and really what I'm asking is to show, either train me that I'm not in this situation again, but the real thing I'm asking is I need to just step out of the way and let you fix it. And there are times that God allows us to do that, and there are times that he welcomes us in and says, this is what you need to be looking for the next time around. And he expects us to learn our lessons. Think about the woman caught in the act of adultery. Hmm? You remember her? He said, what? Where are your accusers? She was in her brokenness, and she said, I don't see them. He said, neither do I condemn you. And then before he lets her leave, he says, what? Go and sin no more. In other words, learn this lesson and don't be found in this situation again. And so, hey, I want to encourage you to keep uh, reading through chapter 9. Take time. We've slown it down just a little bit so our videos aren't so long and so that you have time to process these. I want to encourage you to invite friends to, to watch alongside of us and we'll stay in chapter 9 for at least two more segments. So let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we attend to the work of prayer. And we know, Lord, that as we talk with you, you hear us and we have access to you. And Lord, we, we do want to praise you. There's no one like you. And Father, we confess that our sins stand in the way of us. So we pray that you would forgive us of our sins and our unrighteousness. We thank you, Lord, for grace and power and for your listening ear. And Lord, we ask you that you would work in our life, and dear Father, we plunge our helplessness to you. God, we thank you for giving us access through your Son, the grace that, that opens the door wide and will not be shut because of who you are. Father, we celebrate you now in a loving awe and a fear that our heart would be engaged to you, that this is not a magic formula that we're saying, but it's reaching out to a good, good Father who always has time for us. And we thank you for that. And Father, we express now our weaknesses and our helplessness. Maybe there's something right now that you want to confess to God to say, Lord, I need you right here. Go right ahead and do that. He's listening. Now with me, say, Lord Jesus, take this brokenness. I put total confidence in you that you may heal me, strengthen me, and help me learn these lessons that I may grow to maturity in you. I thank you for this, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Love you guys. Have a wonderful week. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. If you can't meet with us on Sunday, then you can watch online at BeulahChurch.com or our YouTube channel, Beulah Church, or you can listen at 10 a.m. on WAME 929 FM or 550 AM. 
and hear the sermon there. If you've never visited with us before or been our guest, we encourage you to go to BeulahChurch.com and reserve your spot either Saturday night from 6 to 7 or three services to choose from on Sunday morning. That would be an 8 a.m., a 9.30, and an 11. Come worship with us. Why? Because we're better together. God bless you guys. See you soon.